Today's episode is brought to you by Engineering.com, a globally trusted source for engineering content. Check out this and many other exclusive videos for the engineering professional found only on Engineering.com TV today. The Internet of Things promises to turn everything from turbofans to tennis shoes into sensor platforms, generating raw data and feeding it through the cloud into algorithms which will draw insight and ultimately make decisions based on data sets that are unimaginably large. The manufacturing industries pioneered this concept with remote machine monitoring and predictive analytics, but there's a price to be paid for being the first. Early systems were proprietary, rigid, and were notably difficult to integrate with modern platforms, especially those based on software as a service. For companies that invested thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions into older systems, how can they integrate modern production equipment such as industrial robotics with legacy platforms? So joining me to ask and answer those questions is Bill Dykus, Product Manager for IoT Platforms with Telet Centurion. Bill has worked in RFID, Big Data Analytics, Pervasive Computing, and Software as a Service with previous experience at IBM at that firm's Pervasive Computing Division. Bill, welcome to the Primary Loop. Thank you for having me. I built it um, as a, uh, I'm a former manufacturing engineering pro professional myself. I can tell you without question, w machines generate vast amounts of data. Originally, it was relatively simple things. It might be heat rise in a, in a motor drive or uh, later now we've integrated a lot of, of things that we associate with quality. So if we're drilling a hole, we're interested in, in vibration and temperatures, you know, multiple channels. Uh, a lot of that data historically was, I won't say wasted, but was not efficiently utilized just because there's so much of it and we really didn't have a good way to get a grip on it down there. Is that still an issue with uh, with industrial IFT? Not really. And, and to your point about the, the vast range of data, we have customers that categorize data as like oh, the deep sensor data, but sometimes the data is simple as something turning on and off and they use you know, we, they utilize it in different ways to understand the performance of individual workstations. So, so to us, you know, we we can the ability to get data is not as much of a problem. You yeah. know, our customers roll out these solutions very quickly. Some of that's due to the nature of how we developed our products, and some of that's the nature of the protocols that have developed more widely in the industry. Bill, we've gone from a, an era in which uh, uh, analog sensor data was analyzed by an engineer who might look for a signal dropout or a spike in a waveform uh, at the raw analog signal. Then we went to smarter sensors, which began using some filtering and some algorithms and some digitization technology. And now, of course, now we are in a world where we have algorithms which can actually aggregate and process that data and kind of do some of the thinking for us in determining what's important and what's not important. So are we, are, are we pulling the engineer out of that loop or changing kind of his or her role into sort of more of a higher level data analyst? Well, I think with, with most things, as you keep adding innovations and technology, you're augmenting the ability of the engineer to give them more data, more decisions, and their, their thought process become higher in, in, as part of the, the manufacturing process. And so they can, they can do more um, with, with that data in different ways and make better, faster decisions. Yeah, is the, um, historically, I mean, production engineers, um, they're pretty reductionist in my experience. They want a go, no-go decision. Everything's a go, no-go gauge, basically. They want a red light or a green light and then and, and nothing in between. Uh, is that still the way this operates now or are we using something that's a little more nuanced in, in how we do this? Well, I, I think you could look at, like t recently we were discussing statistical process control where you have the bands, the upper and lower bands, and as long as the, the, the outputs uh, of the statistical process analysis stayed within those bands, you were okay. So is that a go, no go? It, uh, in some extent it is, but it's, it's within the context of a, a, wide re a wider range of go, no go. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you bring that up. I mean, um, I date to the days when SPC was actually tracked manually um, by, by machine operators. And of course, is that you intuitively, machine operator could develop a sense and say, we're going to nudge up against the upper control limit and it will likely happen at three o'clock tomorrow afternoon. A really good operator could do that. Uh, we're, we now have software technology that can kind of do some of that predictive analytics for us down there. Is, this, is it just straight sort of second derivative thinking where we're just, just going to look at rates and then hit a red light? Or uh, how far have we gone with this? Well, in the context, uh, you know, we're, we're dealing with this now in the context of, of applying AI to the data analysis. And um, AI, and, and in particular, visual inspection, is kind of one of the first instantiations of that because 
looking at a picture is a, a an extremely complex task and and one of the ideal applications. But as we go forward, we're going to be need to be looking at more multivariate data coming from motors and such. It's not just it's vibration, it's temperature, it's rotational speeds, it's it's voltage voltage changes. And and I think we're in the beginning stages of seeing that in in those applications. So in in the in it, I, I just took your question and carried it to the kind of the at the extreme because it, in other aspects, you know, when we talk about data analytics, there's different there's different ways of looking at it. One, there is the traditional event street processing where it, there may or may not be statistical elements to it in terms of some regression analysis and then some threshold, but it could be as simple as a temperature alarm, right? So. And then, at the as I said, in the far extreme, there's the artificial intelligence looking at multivariate data. Yeah. Now, in the aerospace industry, particularly in, in power plants, um, you have the phenomenon of power by the hour and that sort of remote sensing where, where jet engines are actually reporting health data back to maintenance bases without the crew even, even being aware of it while it's operating. And that really helps you plan maintenance of things. Uh, at the other extreme of that, uh, I have spoken to, say, electric motor manufacturers who say, um, we're in a world now where they can specify a motor for a specific, say, automation application. And based on those kind of things we're talking about, like vibration, uh, heat rise, for example, and windings, they can make inferences about duty cycles and loads without actually directly measuring those duty cycles and loads. Is that like, a, is there some uh, a sort of fruit to be picked there in sort of inferring things that aren't immediately apparent with this? Well, I think we're in the early stages of, of seeing that, in particular in the AI. Um, a, a more simple uh, example, um, you, know, we're, we're, you know, we're starting to talk about predictive maintenance and predictive analytics. But in the context of a company that may front end loaders, they, you know, a, a customer of ours collecting data from based upon a cellular telemetry unit where the vehicle sits in the field. And they're, they're doing product like product life cycle management um, for that vehicle. But at the same time, and I think, uh, you know, that data then gets distributed to other systems so that they can monitor for. In other systems being Salesforce, ERP, or a a a dealer distributor network, so that they can provide services both to their dealer network and to their customer. But th that data is coming in both from a from a geo perspective. Where is that vehicle supposed to be? So there's they're tying the, the data together both internally for connected machine purposes, doing product lifecycle management, doing analysis on that. But then there's just this plain old ana threshold analysis of where is that vehicle in the field? Is it supposed to be being started up at midnight? Is it, uh, you know, has that customer has that customer even sold that vehicle? And is it off the dealer's lot? So the data ranges um, are all over the case, all over the place for uh, these types of situations. I build that PLM um, concept that 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 brings up some interesting possibilities. Can you see a world, for example, where a specifying engineer or a purchasing engineer who's buying that piece of heavy equipment basically is told by the heavy equipment manufacturer, "Look, we've analyzed your usage utilization rates and your usage types, and we can show you that you need to upgrade." this hydraulic motor or move to a larger machine, or conversely, uh, you can probably move down to a smaller, lighter, less costly machine. Yeah. I mean, th th those are possibilities and, and we are, we are custom, we're seeing our customers and we have a broad cross section of customers from in inside of automobile factories to connected machines to which are like I use the front end loader, but then there's also the examples of uh, all over the world. We have customers or companies that have like large laser cutting machines that sit inside of the four walls of the factories. And they have a an application that allows them and their customers to monitor the health of that vehicle and then or that machine and then watch what what's doing. And you're absolutely right. That's the next that's the next step where we have other customers that are making recommendations uh, about the use of their machine that it's being underutilized or you need to send it's it, it you know, there's the sizing aspect. But there's also the utilization, capacity utilization. Uh, a company of our customers has a pallet wrapping machine, so they they know when the pallet's done, and they're signaling the the truck, the forklift drivers to come pick up the vehicle. Yeah. So it, it also continuing on in the context of 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 manufacturers of equipment in the context of connected machines, whether that be a front end loader or a laser cutting machine, or one customer we have 
has a, a pallet wrapping machine for inside of warehouses, whether that be an, an Amazon or, or any sort of distribution center, where they're helping provide data to the, the, the company or the, the distribution center when, that, when a pallet is wrapped and it's watching to see how long before it's picked up, or it's actually also telling, hey, I'm open, send me another pallet to be wrapped. So it's in the context of these connected machines and connected data streams and product lifecycle management utilization, it's a driving pro- It's a, more about driving productivity. So, and, it, and we're starting to see that more and more. Yeah. Uh, Bill, back to the factory, because that's where my heart is. Uh, for old production guys like me, um, there is a there's actually sort of a Gaussian distribution of machinery on the shop floor. Some very old stuff, some brand new stuff, some stuff in between, essentially. And a bit like uh, handing down clothes in a large family with lots of kids, um, I've seen frequently uh, something where very, very critical, say, multi-axis machine tools, production machine tools, are moved out of critical close tolerance work into another aspect of the production process because they still have utility and still have considerable life left for a roughing operation or a second operation. The older machines will not have the reporting capability built in of modern equipment done. So you've, you're trying to aggregate data from machinery from multiple different manufacturers, multiple different generations of equipment, and you've got to somehow ethernet or, or wirelessly connect all that into a unified whole. How do you make that work? Well. That is a, a an excellent question because you know I, I alluded to it a little bit earlier in the context that we have customers like one of the largest axle men, you know, tier one uh, automobile parts manufacturer that has makes axles and that, that's just machining stations. Um, they helped. They utilized uh, uh, some of our edge software and our ability to connect to equipment. At the one end, one of the pieces of the equipment is just wrapping a CTE to watch the inductance change. Um, so that they know when the machine is turned on and off or, or there's a change. Um, it, it, and so they're, they're watching like, okay, the machine started, the machine stopped. Well, I know that that part then is, is done. And I'm watching two machines right next to each other. And they're seeing why this one, the, the time to, to build the part is half the time to build this part. What's actually happening there? So it's it's a very simple way of still leveraging the data that's being generated by the system. It's just not in your traditional digital form, right? So it, it, there are pieces of equipment that nowadays, if you go to one extreme, you know, they're, they're more um, compute systems than they are like, you know, compared to a PLC. And we have a whole history of talking to PLCs in a high performance way. So, you know, being in, you know, being able to communicate with the PLC, watch and getting those signals, transferring these tags into actual properties and data points that then we can process either in at the edge or communicate to a larger enterprise system. It still is to the point that, uh, but it's starting to change. Most uh, systems, industrial systems for a, like a factory are still with inside the factory for, for walls, a local data center, so to speak. Um, but we are starting to see more and more uh, companies wanting to send it to some specific data uh, application that might be running in the cloud. Yeah. Uh, Bill, the, um, um, last question and the inevitable one is the elephant in the room. Everyone's talking about it, artificial intelligence. Uh, it, it still at this point requires experienced engineers to look at data and then make decisions at some point. I mean, it could be simple as a capability study and we say, you know what, that equipment's worn out. We've got to rotate it out. We've got to do something or we've got to make an adjustment or we simply have to we have to change uh, uh, feeds and speeds or something to, to pull something in. AI promises to do that for us to the point where you literally could have someone with very little engineering experience who is told by the algorithm what they've got to do to pull something back in a compliance. Is that where we're going? Yeah, I think so. I think it's it's like any innovation. You are building the subject matter expertise. And, you know, we, we used the example of the motor earlier. There are experts in the lifespan of a motor. There's experts inside the factory that can listen and hear when something's wrong, right? You, you know, they know something's wrong. So we need to get to the point before we have to see, hear something negatively happening. So as we continue innovation and basically the science of the motor or science of the data, that'll all get built into models and algorithms. So for example, in, in an oversimplified way, we have an, a, an inspection system that's watching 
wheels. And with as little as 50 pictures, you can, you can train and annotate a model to look for bad lug nuts, scratches on the wheels. It, it's, not, it's, not the big, it's not the unknown, but you, you can train a model very quickly for very specific, discrete applications. At the other end of the spectrum, now you're collecting data for generative AI applications, right? What, what's, you know, are, we're either talking about chat GPT, but in, in the context of an industrial environment, how do we create a generative AI that says, hey, looking at this set of data, we recommend you do this. And, and that, that requires the absorption of, of data. And, and we're headed in that way. We're getting asked by our customers. We're getting asked by our customers to do, create generative AI models to help them do programming in the context of our systems and, and in the context of helping them program our systems by themselves. So all, again, all of this is uh, augmenting and helping the human roll out things faster and monitor them, th monitoring uh, quicker. It's incredible technology. Bill Dykus, Telus Centurion, thanks for joining me on The Primary Loop. Thank you, James. Nice to be here. Well, that's it for this episode of The Primary Loop, brought to you by engineering.com. For our deeper engineering series, visit engineering.com TV for exclusive shows like Manufacturing the Future, Designing the Future, and The Engineering Roundtable, not found here on our YouTube channel. The links are in the description below. Thanks for watching.